great deal of research has been done, one has become aware of far more things that have emerged from excavations that help to confirm with almost an absoluteness what we have advanced in the past, that there were Africans in America before Columbus. They came to America not as slaves, but as masters. I am not the first to suggest there were Africans in America before Columbus, nor is anyone in the modern period. Columbus is the first man to suggest it. In his diaries, and there is a marvelous book, a huge book, a trilogy in fact, published in 1904 by John Boyd Thatcher, three volumes. It covers more than 1,200 pages, which deals with all the diaries and voyages and journals of Columbus in which he points out that on his second voyage, Native Americans of Haiti, which was then known as Española, came to him and told him that black people had come in large boats from the south and the southeast, trading with the Americans in gold-tipped metal spears. Columbus did not believe this, perhaps, but he did a very cautious thing, which is very important to us, in that he sent samples of these metal spears back to Spain. And they were assayed, they were examined by the Spanish metallurgists, and they ruled that these spears had the same ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys as spears then being forged in African Guinea. Furthermore, the Portuguese told Columbus when he returned from his first voyage, the Portuguese told Columbus that they were aware of Africans leaving from the Cape Verde Islands and going far to the west with merchandise in large boats. There are two things to bear in mind here. First of all, the Portuguese was awa were aware of African navigation because the Portuguese had been in Africa since around 1450. They, in fact, had clashed with the Gambian Navy. The Portuguese also were aware of a landmass to the south as a result of African movements, which will come up later in my talk. And furthermore, Columbus had married a Portuguese woman. He had been to Africa in 1484 at the Portuguese port at San Jorge de Mena. His brother Bartholomew had married a Portuguese. They were both aware of the Portuguese court. And in fact, they had been trying to get the Portuguese to finance their journey across the Western Ocean before he went to the Spanish courts. Not only do we have, therefore, the documents of the Portuguese and that of Columbus himself, and oral tradition of the Native Americans, and the fact that the Spanish met metallurgists had ruled on this and shown that it was African, but furthermore, they have found a cotton in the Cape Verde Islands, a cotton, Gossipium hirsutum var punctatum, which they thought was African because it was just off Africa and it had been taken by the Portuguese as they settled in the Cape Verde and planted before Columbus in the Cape Verde Islands. When it was examined, the cytogenics of the cotton showed that it was not African, it was some cotton grown in the Caribbean and South America, which means cotton which had been grown in the Caribbean and South America had got into Africa before Columbus. How? Not only that, Botanical evidence, but the navigational evidence shows, <coughs> the oceanographic survey of the ocean shows that just off the Cape Verde there is a current that takes you to South America. There are three major currents off Africa, about a hundred miles off the African coast, that take you automatically to America. Once you are caught in those currents, whether you plan it or not, you have to get to America unless the fish get you first. Anything that remains afloat is pushed towards America. Off the Cape Verde Islands, the current takes you in onto the tip, the northern tip of South America, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico, 
If you're off the Senegambia, it takes you to South America, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico. If you're off the southern coast of Africa, it takes you towards South America, and you could fall into the currents that take you into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico. The evidence shows that, and I will leave the Columbus period aside for a moment, the evidence shows that there were Africans, America, not only before Columbus, but before Christ. And it has been carbon dated, and we can establish this beyond the shadow of a doubt. The reason why history has to be reconstructed in the Americas and in Africa in the way it is done now is because we cannot use the same historical methods that are used in Europe. Europe has had the enormous advantage of the conquest in that its libraries have remained fairly intact for many centuries. Our libraries have been shattered and it's not a question of the lack of libraries. In the Americas alone, there were thousands of books. Only three major American books survived. And they're not even in America. They're in Germany, they're in Spain. Three books survived. One of them is the Popol Vuh the Bible of the Kiche Maya. You have the Titulo Koyoi, which Jairaz Boy mentions. You have other codices. These things are the few things that survive. The destruction of libraries in Egypt, the sack of Alexandria, which destroys, as I pointed out this morning, perhaps half a million documents. The destruction of the Moorish documents in which blacks were involved, not just blacks, you have Arabs of different complexions and races perhaps, but you have an Arab-African thing in the Moorish domination of Europe. You have Cardinal Ximenez destroying about 84,000 manuscripts in Arabic at a time when many Africans and Arabs and even others wrote in Arabic as the language of science of the time. And Timbuktu was raised to the ground twice. So it's not just the absence of documents, but the destruction of documents. Fortunately, history does not leave its mark only on written documents. History leaves its mark on everything. If you do not find the books, there are scripts. If you do not find, there are skeletons, there are sculptures, there are plants. There are many things that have left their mark, and that is the reason why we reconstruct history by going to all of those strands, into all of those avenues. It is not an ah historical method, it is the only valid, genuine historical method to reconstruct the fragmented history of Africa and America. In the case of Columbus, for example, why is it we who are so familiar with the voyages of Columbus are not aware of the fact that Columbus never touched the American continent? Why are we not aware of the fact that Columbus remarked on this matter not just once, Several times he mentioned on his third voyage that he went along the coast of Africa, that he stopped in the Cape Verde for several days looking for black animals because he found both the Africans and the Native Americans in the Caribbean were sacrificing black animals and he wanted to please them with a black animal as a gift. That he wandered further finding no such black animals, he wandered further into the Senegambia current and was swept. He said he had six ships, three were sent on the normal route, and the, he was swept on the Senegambia current, making it in far less time, but under grievous conditions, because the Europeans were totally unaccustomed to the great sun burning down upon them in tropical latitudes. And Columbus reports how the heat was so great on, in the equatorial regions as he took the African route, that the caskets burst, the meat roasted and putrefied, and that he feared for the, for the life of his men and himself if rain had not fallen. All these things are recorded in the document. They're just the sides. They're just the sides. Things dismissed, pushed aside, until we put together the botanical evidence, Gossipium, Persutum, Var, Punctatum, the metallurgical evidence that the Spanish metallurgists had assayed the metal spheres and showed them to be African, the navigational evidence, because the currents move in that direction and the Portuguese had noted Africans had the navigational capacity and were actually setting out from the Cape Verde. The documented evidence, both of Columbus himself and of the Portuguese, the oral tradition of the Native Americans, all of these things are there. 
until we pull them together, they make no sense because they're constantly being thrust aside because they suggest Africans are where they should not be. Let me deal not with that early period because I merely point it as an, out as an example of the method that is used to reconstruct history and that it is a valid and legitimate method and the only method that is available to us now because of the great destruction of documents. It was in 1858 that peasants in the village of Tres Zapotes in the Gulf of Mexico discovered enormous stone head. This stone head weighed 10 tons, just a head, 10 tons. It was made of basalt stone and it had vividly Africoid features as, as Dr. Matthew Sterling was later to comment on it nearly a century later that it was vividly African. Vividly Negroid was his term. It had broad nose, very full lips. It was clearly one of the classical African types. It had a helmet, which had never been seen on any sculpture found that so far in America. Close by it was found a stele, which indicated a date of about 291, November the 4th, 291 BC. 291 years before Christ. They were not sure, however, if that date necessarily related to the head. And at that point in time, no archaeology, no serious archaeology had been done in America. However, in 1938, a scientific expedition set out from the Smithsonian Institute, University of California, and the National Geographic, and they found that head again. They not only found that head, but the following year, they proceeded to another spot, La Venta, where someone noted they had seen uh, a similar head. And they dug up four heads at La Venta between 1939 and 1940. Four heads were dug up at La Venta. And they, again, it was the same thing. Enormous heads, six to nine feet high, just a head, weighing between 10 to 40 tons in weight, having African-type features. And the same type of helmet, as Jai Rasboy has pointed out, you could find it at Tanis in the Egyptian Delta, with a flap falling along the side of the head. A kind of crest with a flap and incised markings, etc. And the extraordinary thing is that I discovered last year through a friend of mine, he's Wayne Chandler, he's an anthropo, um, photojournalist, he discovered in the files of the Smithsonian a photograph that has been suppressed for nearly 50 years, which is shown here for the first time in public in my slides, which shows that the first head that was discovered not only had African features, but Ethiopian braids. It's carved out in the stone. It has never been published, it has never been shown. On top of the heads, the stone heads, they found terracottas, that is clear sculptures of Africa. Now with respect to those with the helmets, with the exception of the one I mentioned, you could say, okay, fine, perhaps it's a mistake, perhaps it's an accident, that's what they said. First they said they were baby faces, that's why they had full nose and full mouth. They were faces of babies. Then they said the reason why they have these enormous lips is because they're the snarling mouths of jaguars. These people among whom they were found, the Olmec, they worshipped jaguars, and therefore the snarling mouth of the jaguar was copied. Then they said, one of them said it was made of molten rock, and it fell on its face, and that's why it became flat and full. The latest explanation is most ingenious. The Science Digest did an article on me in September 1981, in which they presented my case very fairly and objectively, showing the, the nature of the objections of the establishment, including one eminent historian of Mexico, Michael Coe. And they went to Michael Coe, Boyce Rensberger, the leading science writer for the Times who did the story on me. He went to Michael Coe and he said, do you believe what Van Sertum is saying that these are African? And Michael Coe said, 
They don't look at all African, and even if they do, this is his words, you know, even if they do, the reason why they have full noses, the reason why they have broad noses and full lips is because the tools were blunt and they couldn't make them any sharper. <laughs> That's the leading authority on the Americas, the historic Americas. What? Let me present the case for the dating. <clears throat> on the wooden ceremonial platform where four of these stone heads were found at Leventa, which turned out to be the holy capital of the Olmec world, O-L-M-E-C, Olmec, the first major civilization in America. The dating of the wooden platform, the charcoal, there were nine samples of charcoal dating, gave a reading of 948 to 680 BC. It's not just the stone head, but in addition to the stone head, you have terracottas that are clay sculptures of African types. Not only the nose now and the lips, the hair is clearly Africoid. Because even though you have you could say that some Asiatic types who came across the Bering Straits may have Africoid type features. The hair now is very distinctive, the kink and coil of the Africoid hair, very distinctive on the head of the terracottas. And what is more, and note this, the artist went to the trouble of selecting oxide dyes for the clay so that it could be dark brown or dark red or dark black so that it could be distinguished from the other terracottas. So that on the dark terracottas, you're finding these, this African peculiarity of feature. And in addition to that, in addition to the stone heads of which there are 14 spread over Tres de Potes, La Benta, and San Lorenzo in Veracruz, in addition to the terracottas spread all over that Olmec central area, you have skeletal evidence. Professor Wierzynski, a Polish skull expert, was able to show after his study at Tlatelco, at Cerro de las Misas, and at Monte Alban, in the dry areas of the, of the Olmec civilization, where the Olmec from the swamps had moved into these areas, he showed Africoid types. He said it's probably West African. I have just come from a meeting in New Mexico before 200 professors who are studying ancient scripts who have established beyond the shadow of a doubt, and I shall deal with that later in my talk, that the Egyptian script traveled to America before Christ, around 800 BC. They have found on the Davenport Stella, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, the Libyan script, and the Iberian tunic side by side, reading the same thing. And it could not be forged because it was found before the Libyan or the Iberian tunic was deciphered. Uh, but they did not know the Egyptian had anything to do with blacks. I informed them. <laughs> well, the Reader's Digest had a big, uh, big article after my book turned out. Europeans in America, 800 BC, the same period that I had pointed to. Europeans in America before, before Christ. Who are these Europeans? The Egyptians. It's taken for granted in most of these circles that Egyptians have nothing to do whatsoever with Negroes. In the Olmec world, as I say, you have this corroboration of evidence, the skeletal evidence in the dry areas, because in the swampy areas, no skeletal evidence survived. Jairaz Boy has pointed to a very important thing, that is the possibility even of mummification in the Olmec world, but because the skeletons were not preserved, we find it in a statue where you have the rib cage outlined the hands closed together, the fingers open, the shroud, etc., just like in the Egyptian world. Nowhere on earth, on any archaeological site, could you find a corroboration of so much evidence, stone head representing a distinct physical type, terracottas representing the same type with the texture of hair and coloration of skin, and skeletal evidence representing that type, as high as 13.5% at Tlatelco, going down to 4.5% at Monte Alban. And you yet deny the existence of that type because it involved African and it could not be there. The general assumption, the conventional assumption, is that only Europeans and Asiatics can move. Africans do not migrate. Hence, if you find them outside of their milieu, or you find them doing something unusual, 
Either someone moved them, as Jeffries pointed out to me, someone brought them there. Even Wiener, Leah Wiener, the pioneer in this subject who in the 1920s at Harvard recognized through a study of philology that there were Africans in America before Columbus. What Wiener was trying to show is that the Africans were merely bringing over Arab Islamic ideas and concepts and culture. The Africans had no culture therefore until the Arabs came. So even he, although he was showing there were Africans in America before Columbus, he was really saying that they had been porters or paddlers and they had brought over another man's cultural electricity. We have to be very careful to note that even with new discoveries, the script for the African is still not rewritten. Okay, so some Africans came to America before Columbus, so what? What did they do? <laughs> Thank God they've changed the tune because now I'm going to show what they did. Because we have evidence of what they did do because it leaves marks. The first pyramid to appear in America appears right at La Venta on the very same ceremonial platform where the stone heads first appear. In the first of the sequence, although they find later Thresopotis and San Lorenzo, the first of the sequence of the stone heads is at Leventa, and both the conical pyramid as well as the step pyramid appear. They said, well, ah, but the functions are not the same. It's just a temple in America. It's a tomb in Egypt. That is not true. We have found many, many Pyramids could be cited in America, which serve both as tomb as well as temple. And in Egypt, many of the great pyramids have temples adjoining. So they have both the tomb and temple combination. And in the great ones, the very great ones, the one at Teotihuacan in Mexico and the one at Giza or Giza in Egypt, they not only have the same base, the identical base, but they also have the, the third function the geodetic marker or the use of the cap movable capstone for astronomy, the notches, etc. They said at first that the Teotihuacan pyramid was one meter off from the Egyptian pyramid. Now they're allowing that meter because of mistakes in the reconstruction and excavation. It means it's roughly the same base as the Egyptian pyramid. I'm not saying Africans built the pyramid in America. Don't misunderstand me. I am saying ideas and influences were carried forward by that migrating group. There was a reason why there may have been Egyptians and Nubians in the Atlantic. They have no business being in the Atlantic. Egypt is too far away from the Atlantic. But there were reasons at that time, three reasons. First of all, there was a war with Asia. The Asiatics, the Syrian, Forces in Asia, the mighty power of Western Asia, were moving down the Mediterranean with their iron-powered armies. They had captured the Jews. The blacks saved the Jews in 701 BC, when Tahaka, the great Ethiopian general, before he became king, head of the Ethiopian Egyptian forces, marched into Jerusalem to save the Jews. They were on the, when King Hezekiah of the Jews was trembling before the Asiatics. The Africans entered the battlefield and the Asiatics were defeated. There was a war going on. They had closed the eastern seaports. They found trade by Egyptians right up to Hawaii. They found Egyptian trade goods and scripts as far as Hawaii as Dr. Fell has shown. They had closed those trade routes. The Egyptians and the Phoenicians who were the who were accounted for 50% of Egyptian import-export trade, were forced west of the Mediterranean. Script, Barry Fell has shown among the Mi'kmaq, a whole series, a whole series of words in astronomy, as much as 90% in one area, 90% of the astronomy words are identical with Egyptian, the songs. You go to the script and you look at the Iberian Punic, the Libyan and the Egyptian together and the Davenport Stella, the hymn to the Aton written in the American. How come when I was at the conference in Arizona, I met a gentleman, I forget his name now, some famous doctor whose name passes me because I got so furious with him, I have forgotten him. 
He's written a book on the Micmac, challenges me. I said, all right, sir, if you think that this is a fake, I have both before me. I have the Micmac and I have the Egyptian. You are so acquainted with the Micmac. Show me which is which. I don't want to be drawn in that, he said. But the audience, they really embarrassed him. They said, show him. Show him. Show him which is the fake. Didn't dare do it. Didn't dare do it. There's so many, and, and it is true that in scripts you can have occasional parallels because there's a limit to human science, but these things were for arbitrary things, very complex markings for arbitrary things. And there was no question of correspondence, correspondence so remarkable, so plentiful that there was no question, no statistical possibility of accident or fluke or coincidence. You go to Elvia John in the Almic world, and there is paper made from wood pulp. Nowhere in America were they making paper from wood pulp. Nowhere in the world, except in Egypt at that time, where both the papyrus and the wood pulp was making paper. It was done in China later. It appears in the Almic world. Isolated incident that appears in the Almic world. You go and look at their other aspects of their technology. Professor Heiser, who had attacked this thesis all his life, in the last three years of his life, he was converted. Do you know what he did? He stopped publishing. He started writing things in favor of the Egyptian thesis, but he didn't publish it. It is now in the Smithsonian, his posthumous files. There is where we have found that Heiser showed that the heavy transport techniques the Native Americans were using in the swamps were identical with the Egyptian heavy transport techniques. All of us marvel at the Egyptians how they move those incredible stones, taking 50 ton capstones and putting it at the top of their skyscrapers without being a fraction of an inch off. And these guys are suddenly, people, they were marvelous at sculpture, yes, but they're suddenly making these colossal things which they never made before. Making it out of this incredible basin stone, one block of stone. Some of them close to 40 tons in weight, bringing them down from the quarries to their platforms and building them up with the same skill and ingenuity, technological ingenuity the Egyptians when they hadn't been done doing it before. How come? How come when we go to the Middle Americans and study the way they have, the, not, not the exact proportions because individual pyramids change, but they have so many things in their mathematics that are close as the man who is recently done, um, Peter Tompkins, who has done studies of the Mexican pyramids and the Egyptian pyramids, so the correspondences, the structural correspondences, even in spite of superficial difference. And when we come to ritual, that is the most astonishing thing, and I must give great credit to Jairaz Boy for what he's done in ritual. Jairaz Boy showed several gods of the Egyptian that are identical with the American. There is the god Sokar, he is standing there and he has open arms, outstretched arms, and he has wings on his arms and he's standing on the back of a snake and the snake has a, a head at the head and a head at the tail. You go to Mexico and there is this man, this God standing there with arms outstretched, wings on his arms, standing on a snake with a head at the head and a head at the tail. How come? The God Aken, he pointed to the double rope swallowing God, identical the faceless Aken with the double, swallowing the double rope there in Mexico in the Almec world. He shows feathered sun shades, three, made of three concentric circles, three colors. These are very detailed things. These are very complex correspondences. They're not flukes. And there you find the same thing duplicated, the double crown. Who wears the double crown in all the world except the Egyptians who united the north and south? For whom there was a political necessity to have a double crown, the red and the white crown. And there among the Olmec, we found two examples of it now. Chief dignitaries wearing a double crown. The flail, the crook, you find it on the Olmec dignitaries as among the Egyptians. The use of purple. We have found the codex, a codex is recent, not our codex, showing pictures of black-skinned as well as red-skinned kings in ancient America. And you look at the nobility, you look at the women, you look at the kings, and the priest kings, and you find purple 
as a, as a symbol, as a signal of their index of their rank, just like among the Egyptians. And there's recently been done a study in purple, the Phoenician thing about purple, their, their search for purple because purple was sacred among the Egyptians. It is emblematic of the power of the gods. And the Phoenicians, in their travels, exhausted most of the purple supplies in the Mediterranean. There is another suggestion of why they should have come to the Americas for this purpose. You look at other ritual scenes. The human-headed bird, Ba, is found in Mexico. A bird with a human head. This is in Egypt and on the Egyptian tombs and they have a little hole in the tomb with the bird to fly out. You see it duplicated in America. Nowhere else. All these correspondences. How come? How can you explain that these things were not happening before they have no antecedent? They are complex. They are not just single traits. They are a complex of interlocking parallels. Why should we believe that it took Columbus who stumbled into the Caribbean, which he called Asia. Do you know Columbus called America India? It wasn't called America, it was called India. That is why we're still calling the Americans Indians. We still call the Native Americans Indians. Columbus had a right theory, which in fact was not new. The Arabs and Africans knew the world was wrong. You look at the globes that Africans used and Arabs used to teach geography. They were all wrong. So only Europeans believed the world was flat until some of their geniuses were persecuted, proving that it was wrong. That's a fact. You look at the maps, those early maps. You look at the early globes that were used in geography. But the thing, and you find it in Arabic documents in the Moorish period, there was assumption all through that Moorish period that the world was wrong. Columbus was new about that. He was right, theoretically, if the world is wrong, you could go far to the west and end up in the east. What he didn't know is that you would need an airplane to do it, not the Santa Maria. So the Santa Maria collided, collided with another continent, and he assumed, do you know that even though Columbus doubted that it was Asia, you know what he did? He sent his notary, Fernando Pires de Luna, among the ships and got every man to sign a document that he was off the continent of Asia. He couldn't take any chances. They spent a lot of money sending him out. He had to find India. He had to find the treasures of Marco Polo, come what may. And he got them to sign a document and he threatened them. If any man were to say they didn't go to the continent of Asia or they were not off the continent of Asia, if there were officers, they would be fined 500 Maravedi, several months' salary, and if there were common sailors, they would be given 100 lashes and have their tongues cut out. That's in the documents. That's the great discoverer, St. Christopher. When he came back, he was coming back to Spain. A storm blew his ships into Lisbon, Portugal. The Portuguese were rivals of the Spanish. He sat down. My book begins and that is no fiction. I have researched every word of it. He sat down to dinner with the Portuguese king, King John II. They sat to dinner on March the 9th, Saturday evening, 1493. Rain fell the next day. I know all the details that were put down. <laughs> Franca on the left bank of the Tagus on Monday, I don't know what for. But there in that weekend, on that Saturday and Sunday, there were discussions. And at the dining table, he brought with him six Native Americans whom he captured. He was the first man to make slaves out of the Native Americans. And he brought six Native Americans with him who fascinated the Portuguese court with their, the red tint of their skins and their hair. These are not the Africoid types who visited. I'm talking about the Native Americans who came across the Bering Straits during the glacial migrations. And he brought these men. And while they were at table, a dish of beans were brought out by, at the order of King John. And King John beckoned to one of these people with sign language to build with these beans on the table 
these lands that Columbus said he had discovered, and a chain or necklace of islands was built up, which included various parts of the Caribbean, Cuba, the Lucas Islands, etc. And when King John saw the um, massiveness of the discovery, the so-called discovery, because Spain is small compared to the, the Caribbean. The Caribbean stretches over 1,000 miles of the Atlantic. Some of you don't think so because you came from it and you think it's pretty small. I'm not talking about small in the sense in which you think of it. I'm talking about its physical size. They were upset because the Portuguese, both King John I and the II, had refused to give Columbus permission or, or support. And now the Spanish were going to rule two worlds. And they were so upset by that, that they asked Columbus to go back home and argue for a line to be drawn across the world to separate the claims of the two Catholic kingdoms. This was known as the Tordesillas Line. It was signed on June the 4th, 1494, before the discovery of South America by Europeans, before Cabral had got there in 1500. And it was, it was drawn across the pit. The Pope did not give it his blessing until afterwards, but it was drawn in 1494 in the Treaty of Tordesillas, and it includes South America, and they had never seen it. It includes Brazil. 200 miles of territory from that ocean going right back and what why did the Portuguese do that they hadn't been there they were concentrating in the route along Africa up in danger because of the strength of knowledge they got from Africans who were aware of a southern land mass who were aware of a southern land mass just below the equinoctial line within the same latitudes as Guinea and Columbus was told about it. Columbus went back to Spain and, and argued because he was then prince of the ocean sea. He came almost like a king. He was nothing. He argued with the Spanish that they should agree with the Portuguese. Let them draw the line because there's only water within the line. It's only 375 leagues from the Cape Verde, which is four and a half miles according to Vespucci. Roman miles give it four, but they give it four and a half, about 1,600 miles. And Columbus said, nothing to worry about. You're not giving anything to the Portuguese. I have traveled twice as many leagues, and I have found no such land, which is true, because Europe is twice as far from America as is Africa. But when Columbus was on his second voyage, a man called Jaime Ferrer appeared in the Spanish court and told Ferdinand and Isabella that Columbus was lying, that he had knowledge from Arabs and Ethiopians, the word Ethiopian was generally used for African, that there was a landmass to the south within the line that the demarcation line they were drawing up between the Portuguese claims and the claims of the Spanish. And he said a damaging thing. He said, Columbus knows more about this sleeping than I do waking. So when Columbus was sent a letter from the king of Spain, he said, please come home immediately. And I want to know all that you know about this demarcation line. Columbus wrote back to say, I have arthritis and I am too ill to move. And then he said something which was a deliberate lie because he knew it was not true. He said, Cuba is the continent. I have found the continent. I'm no longer among the islands. Cuba is the continent because my ships cannot circumnavigate it. He knew that was not true because whether his little ships could circumnavigate it or not, the natives had lived there for centuries and had told him so, and he had made this clear to the Chancellor of Aragon months before this missive. So when he came back, they didn't want to hear anything more about colonizing the Caribbean. They wanted to send him to find the southern landmass, so they gave him six ships. And he sent three ships along on the earlier route, and he sent three ships along Africa. And here are the three ships coming down into the Cape Verde, searching for black animals, going into the semi-Gambia current, then into the tropical latitudes. And they landed one day's journey from South America. They landed in a place where they saw three hills. And he said those three hills reminded him of the Trinity, so he called it Trinidad. Very religious man. The next day, the ships landed in South America. Columbus did not come off the ship the great navigator so eager to explore 
would not come off the ship because he's terrified to give the Portuguese away. Because I found the letter he wrote to his son Diego Columbus in 1505, in which Amerigo Vespucci is about to appear before the Spanish court. And he says, tell him to do this and to say this and to say that and to do this and to do that because the man would do anything for me. It was his brother, Genoese brother, tricking both the Spanish and the Portuguese. And he said, certain monies are being paid to me, but I cannot detail them here. I'll detail them yonder. What money is he talking about? Not Spanish money for the prospective discoveries in America. It's the Portuguese money for keeping the Spanish away from the South. That's why Columbus pretended he had an arthritic fit. Because he did not want to go into the South. That is why he was arrested. How many of us are aware of that? On his fourth voyage, he was arrested by Bobadilla. He and his brother Bartholomew and sent back like a black in the hold of the ship to be tried in Spain. So all this Columbus period is built upon a fraud. <laughs> Heyerdahl, Thor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian explorer, took a papyrus reed boat, which the Egyptians had used and the Ethiopians had used on their inland lakes and elsewhere. And he showed that the curves of this boat showed that it could cross the ocean. It wasn't just for inland shipping, and it was used 800 years before Christ. And he said it can cross the Atlantic. And scientists scoffed at him. Scientists took the papyrus reed and said, if you put it in a tank, it will sink. And they put it in the tank and it sank. And Haidar said, if I took a piece of the Queen Mary, which is made of iron, and put it in a tank, it would also sink. <laughs> So, rising above the idiocies of the scientists, he built the papyrus reed boat with the help of Abdullah de Jibrin and the Baduma people on Lake Chad in 1969. And they sailed across the Atlantic successfully. They only got in trouble off Barbados because the Africans had forgot, the Africans had cut a rope which was attached to the bow and the deck. And they cut that rope thinking it merely had to do with curvature and of the bow. In fact, it was a flotation device. That was the only mistake they made. When the Aymara Indians, without the help of African experience, rebuilt the identical boat, because on Lake Titicaca in South America, the identical boat was being used, that was used by the Egyptians. They crossed the Atlantic in the Ra 2. And the strange thing about the Ra 1 is that, as I have said, it did not steer to America, it came by itself. The rudders broke on the first day, they could not steer. The currents took the thing from Africa and landed it in America. And Hyadal is not the only one. There have been 120 experiments with small boats across the Atlantic. And it has been shown that the small boat can arrive earlier than Columbus or Vespucci. And a man who showed that you have experiments by Alain Bombard and Hans Lindemann. Bombard set out in a dugout, which no African would be mad enough to use on the Atlantic. He set out in a dugout without a crew, without a sail, and crossed the Atlantic safely from Africa to America in less time than either Columbus or Vespucci. And talking about the boats of Columbus and Vespucci, the sails on those boats were Arab Latin sails, which Arabs and Africans had used on the Indian Ocean. They were not European sails. The compass was not invented in Europe. The astrolabe was not invented in Europe. It is true that after the massive and continuous migrations of people to the Americas, that you had an improvement in hulls, an improvement in ships, which went far beyond the other conquered peoples. But at that time, those boats were not superior. So to think that man had to sit down and wait for centuries until the stumble of Columbus landed in India and called Cuba the continent and South America an island, this has nothing to do with the truth of the past. But as I come to a close, I want you to bear this in mind. The history of the world is not written. The history of Europe, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you.
There remains a great deal to be done. There's a whole world out there. Every time I go back into Mexico, extraordinary things are found. They found the pyramid of Comalcalco with bricks, with various writings, boats, scripts thereon, which has recently been found. A whole new set of things are emerging. This is not a finished chapter. This is no closed chapter. This last chapter has been written with a certain eye, an eye which has been blind to the genius of the African. Therefore, it is only by opening another eye, by having a different kind of illumination, a different kind of vision, that the history of the Americas and the history of Africa can be truly written. Thank you.